I now have the great honor of introducing someone who really has changed the world dr dramatically, our commencement speaker, Dr. Bob Metcalf. Bob joined the University of Texas in January of 2011 as Professor of Innovation. And since then, he has helped create a stronger entrepreneurial culture and ecosystem at the university, in Austin, and in Texas. Bob created a new class, the name of which says it all, One Semester Startup. Now going into its third semester, this class aims to help student startups by teaching the fundamentals of company formation around an idea, a technology, and a business. Bob has been a catalyst for innovation and entrepreneurship, building on the roots that have grown deep at UT over many years. Bob himself is a National Technology Medalist and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He has brought with him to Texas a wealth of experience and career impact. In the 1970s, Bob worked at the famed Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, where he invented today's local area networking standard, the Ethernet. I should point out that the music and photo photos from earlier this evening that you saw on the screen above you were streamed using Ethernet. The entire world depends on Ethernet today. After his invention, Bob co-founded and grew the billion-dollar computer networking company, 3Com Corporation, which eventually merged with Hewlett Packard in 2010. And the impact of network communications has been astonishing. Bob was there at the beginning. Bob was also the publisher of the influential magazine Info InfoWorld, writing an internet column with a half a million weekly readers. Those were back in the days when techies actually read magazines. Prior to joining the university, he was a general partner of Boston-based firm Polaris Ventures, and he continues to advise the firm as a venture partner. I want to thank Bob for his commitment and advocacy for the University of Texas and our students. I know Bob doesn't want to make Austin the next Silicon Valley. He wants to make it a better Silicon Valley. Bob, given all that you've accomplished in the year and a half you've been here, I don't know if there's a person more capable of this goal than you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Professor of Innovation, Dr. Bob Metcalf. Let's begin with a question. Are you an engineer? a show of hands of the engineers that are here. Well, I'm an engineer and I'm proud of it. Now, there's no need to tell the other convocations that are going on around campus. Just keep it between us. But it's we engineers who make the world go round and I'm here to say hooray for us. <laughs> By solving the world's uh, problems through technological innovation, it is we engineers who energize that virtuous circle of freedom and prosperity. And so I say to you today with great enthusiasm, engineers, commence. This is a commencement ceremony. Commence. Now, speaking of commencements, I love commencements, and I'll tell you why. Because we get what we celebrate, and what the world needs to celebrate today is you. It's a good thing that you're here today, and you should remember this day for the rest of your lives, especially your commencement speakers. But as you graduate, get this, commencements may be great occasions like weddings and funerals, uh, but they're not really for the guests of honor, as you've, in fact, just heard. If you've ever been to one, you know that a wedding is not really about the bride and groom. It's about the proud parents, and particularly the mother of the bride. Uh, funerals are certainly not to delight the deceased. And commencements, they're not really about you. Commencements are to celebrate the love and dedication and sacrifice of those who got you here. Anyway, let's thank them again.
Now, the degree, the degree that you're about to receive certifies in writing that you're among the world's best graduating engineers. So you already know that to be good at something, something that requires persistent attention and sustained effort, to be good at it, it has to be fun. It has to bring you the joy of mastery, a gratifying sense of accomplishment, and let's face it, it needs to bring you smiles from your family and friends. Fun. So let me, getting to fun, let me skim over the standard package of commencement speech advice. Just quick summary, and then I'll get on to the meat of my talk. Uh, eat healthy, exercise regularly, use sunblock, Lost the teeth you want to keep. And now the secret of happiness. All you really need to be happy is something to be enthusiastic about. And for us, I think, we engineers, it's engineering. So that done, I'd like to take the remaining two hours of my talk to go over some of the ways in which you are likely to have fun over the next 50 years. And to do this, I googled the National Academy of Engineering, which has a list called Grand Challenges. And to come up with this list, they, uh, they uh, assembled 18 uh, engineering geniuses, half of whom I know and the other half I worship. There are 14 grand challenges, and all of them offer engineers much to be enthusiastic about. I don't know why 18 geniuses came up with only 14 challenges. I, they must have had an attendance problem toward the end of the event. Anyway, it's a great list. I recommend it highly. You can find all four of them on the Internet, at, along with everything else, at engineeringchallenges.org. So to follow are the 14 grand challenges in no particular order with a few comments that I cannot resist. And as an extra bonus, I'm going to add a 15th at the end, uh, which I believe will scare the hell out of you. Uh, and in passing, I'll predict, I'm going to predict the next gadget, the next big gadget uh, that some of you are going to help engineer. You know, you know about the iMac and the iBook and the iPod and the iPhone and the iPad. The I what? What is the next gadget? And I'm going to predict what it is in passing, going through the 14 challenges. So grand challenge number one, engineering the tools of discovery. Science and engineering are not as separate as our university silos would suggest. Scientists need engineered tools to gather new, na uh, new knowledge, and many of the best scientists engineer their own tools. Engineers need the discoveries of science, uh, some of those of their own, to solve ever harder problems. Challenges number two and number three, energy, solar, and fusion. The way I see it, Earth is a large fission reactor whose thermalized radioactive decay has for five billion years kept our planet from becoming a permanent snowball. We can harvest the energy of the Earth's natural fission reaction through what's called geothermal energy, or we can build artificial fission reactors like the 104 that now provide 20% of our electricity. It's going to be very interesting to watch y'all build safer, cleaner, smaller, cheaper fission reactors in the future. But fusion, on the other hand, is both more promising and more difficult. Ironically, a natural fusion reactor flies across the sky every day, mocking physicists everywhere. And today, the way we harness energy from our solar reactor is by means of thermal or photovoltaic solar panels. So making solar energy economic, say, say cheaper than coal, is an ongoing engineering challenge. We're not there yet. In the coming decades, we'll decide if we should build artificial fusion reactors on Earth, right here. I look forward to your progress on that. Challenge number four and five, carbon and nitrogen. Right now, we seem to be putting too much carbon into the atmosphere and taking too much nitrogen out. Uh, 
I'd like to suggest that you all engineer some ways to harvest the CO2 profitably. Uh, and, and after all, CO2 is a plant food. Number six, water. Millions of humans die each year because of a lack of clean water. We urgently need to engineer better ways to find, distribute, purify, and desalinate water. Now, abundant energy will help us a lot in getting the clean water that we desperately need. Number seven, urban infrastructure. Humans are flocking to cities by the billions. Among our urban technologies that need improvement are those for transportation. A million people die each year in car accidents. Would somebody please engineer electric robot cars that drive themselves? That way I don't have to own a car. I don't have to stand in line at the Department of Motor Vehicles. There should be an app for that. Number eight, medicine. Science is now learning enough about biology that we're beginning to engineer medicines that actually cure diseases instead of relying on trial and error drug experiments that deliver only marginal improvements in suffering and life expectancy. Personalized medicines, medical robots, etc. Modern medical research universities like the one we're planning here in UT Austin, our new medical school, that should have as many engineers in it as it has biologists and doctors. Uh, and, and by the way, I would sprinkle in a few entrepreneurs. In the last century, we added 30 years to our lifespan, but only five of those 30 years came from medicine. The other 25 came from a study of what we call public health. So we better be sure to engineer some public health solutions uh, starting with obesity, and I should talk. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Number nine, reverse engineering the brain. I've used my brain to think of three great reasons to figure out how the brain works. First, if we knew how it worked, we could help fix the ones that are broken. Second, we can enhance our brain so that we can think superhumanly. Third, we can develop ways to make our computers more powerful by mimicking the brain once we understand it. Ten, health informatics. The Internet has disrupted a growing series of industries in a good way, using technology standards and information infrastructure. We've changed forever mail, telephone, television, books, music, shopping, advertising, politics, newspapers, journalism, and dating. The next big three industries ripe for disruption are energy, education, and health care. So let's figure out how to get health care on the Internet. Number 11 and number 12, securing cyberspace and preventing nuclear terror. All coins have a flip side. All technologies have unintended consequences. We engineers need to remember to go back and clean up our messes like those two. Number 13, enhancing virtual reality. I'm not sure why the NAE's 18 geniuses put enhancing virtual reality on their short list. I hope it's not because they're dissatisfied with real reality. But this leads to my prediction. After the iPod and the iPhone and the iPad, what is the next iWatch? What's the next thing that we're all going to be buying and carrying with us all times? I've recently worn the device, the iWatch. I call it the eyeglasses. Seeing through them, one can escape into HD virtual reality, or more likely, enjoy augmented reality, seeing clearly at night, or getting help remembering names at parties. In a few years, you're all, I predict, in a few years, you're all going to be wearing eyeglasses in various designer colors. The interesting question is, what will be their killer app? I can't wait to find out. Last but not least, Grand Challenge 14, personalized learning. Education is next up on the Internet's list of disruptions. I recently met a Stanford professor who put his artificial intelligence course up on the Internet 
and more than 100,000 people registered. 20,000 completed the course and received certificates. That professor has left Stanford University to join a startup that will soon be offering all of computer science to the world through some variation of an internet course. At MIT, a professor put his electronic circuits course up on the internet. He also got more than 100,000 registrants. Now, there's a lot of engineering ahead on this, but our current schools, colleges, and universities had better watch out. By just building buildings and selling textbooks and raising tuitions, our beloved universities risk ending up like Polaroid and Kodak. Do you remember Polaroid and Kodak? They could not see that cameras would be replaced by Internet phones without film, and they're gone now. So those are the 14 grand challenges of the National Academy of Engineering, and I think you'll agree with me it's going to be fun meeting those challenges over the next 50 years. It'll also be fun adding to this list as a way of keeping you busy for the 50 years after that, and then the 50 years after that. So let me add a 15th grand challenge, asteroids. Some of you may remember, they were certainly before my time, dinosaurs. It was an asteroid that 65 million years ago wiped out the dinosaurs and most other species on Earth. More recently, this month, a bus-sized asteroid zipped unexpectedly between the Earth and the Moon, a close call at tens of thousands of miles per hour, and it will be back. NASA knows about thousands of asteroids that are large enough and close enough to threaten life on Earth. I'm worried more about the asteroids NASA does not know about. So if global warming has you worried, asteroids should scare the hell out of you. Or this should look like the funnest engineering problem not on Earth. I think we should learn how to better detect and deflect the asteroids, probably using space robots. Who would not want to work on that? Well, a startup company just formed in Seattle, perhaps you've read about it, backed by internet tycoons and NASA engineers, to learn how to mine asteroids, which are chuck full of the most valuable elements. Capturing and mining asteroids sounds even harder than detecting and deflecting them. The startup is called Planetary Resources. They're hiring. Today they have 2,000 volunteers ready to mine asteroids. Wouldn't it be cool to join that effort? But don't jump up right now and go to Seattle. I want you to wait a second and uh, be sure to collect your degrees and once again thank your family and friends. But after that, Enthusiastic engineers, I charge you, commence. Thank you.